topic tonight out of Isaiah chapter 49, engraved in my hand. As starting in verse 1, the Lord called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. Now, Robert, it sounds like the microphone's a little hot. If you could turn the microphone down a little bit. Uh, okay, so the Lord called me from the womb. Now we can say that applies to all of us. The Lord has created us. He has known us from our mother's womb, the scriptures tell us. From the matrix of my mother, he had made mention of my name. Now that is unique. That we can't say for everyone. Uh, some people, God named beforehand. Uh, but this, and I don't know if Isaiah is talking about himself. I don't think so. No mention of that. Uh, and then maybe just here. But he says, my mother... Uh, of my mother he made mention, talking about the Lord, made mention of my name. So this person that Isaiah is referring to, again, whether himself or someone else, we uh, will have evidence of who he's referring to if we know, there's one evidence anyway, that, uh, that the person's name was mentioned before they were born. In another chapter in Isaiah, Cyrus is mentioned by name, a uh, a leader of the Medo-Persians, not only by name before he was in his mother's womb, when it was hundreds of years before he was in his mother's womb. Hundreds of years before his mother had a womb, <laughs> long before uh, they were alive. Uh, but here is mentioned, mentioned, made mention of my name. From the matrix, while he was still there, is a mention of it. So God has done that at times, mentioned someone's name even before they were born. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. Okay, so this person that the Lord um, named will be born and will be born from a mother, not uh, like Adam, created out of dust, um, but uh, come out of a woman and be named ahead of time and that God would have be over his mouth. He'd make his mouth like a sharp sword. And the scriptures refer to another thing as a sharp sword. Well, it talks about the word of God as a double-edged sword. And so his mouth, out of this mouth, out of this person that would be born and named beforehand, his words would be like a sharp double-edged sword, like the word of God. And in the shadow of his hand, he would hit him. God would hide him away. And yet polished like a shaft, beautiful, and like a quiver. A bow and arrow in his quiver, he has hidden me. So God's like hiding him in his special arsenal for a special purpose that God has created this being. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And so here he calls him a servant. And we've seen he does that a lot in Isaiah. Isaiah has a whole series of chapters. We've looked at one already about this servant. And here he refers to Israel as that servant. You are my servant, O Israel, and in whom I will be glorified. And so here it's identifying that person born as Israel. An interesting thing is, Israel, we have Israel as a nation. We have Israel as a person. In Jacob's name being changed to Israel. But in the story of Jacob being born, we don't have any mention. We have a lot mentioned about the birth of Jacob and Esau. We don't have it being mentioned that, uh, that, that God said his name would be Jacob. Or in his mother's womb, that his name would be changed to Israel. And yet that was the first verse in this identification. So while it might be Israel the person, Jacob, who became Israel, doesn't exactly fit. Or Israel as the nation even, wasn't born from someone's womb. I mentioned that twice, my mother's womb. As a nation. Then there's another Israel in the Bible that this term refers to. 
continue on, verse 5. And the Lord says, who formed me from the womb, the third time, to be his servant, second time to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. So it says basically the same thing twice. Jacob and Israel are the same person, representing the tribes of Israel. Jacob back to him, and so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Now, if this person, born out of the womb, named beforehand, is the nation of Israel, then how can the nation of Israel bring the nation of Israel back? How can the nation of Israel gather the nation of Israel back? Right? How can it do that to itself? That'd be kind of weird for it to be able to do that. So it's sounding like, in the way it's worded here, that he's using this servant is one who will be born out of a womb that would be named beforehand by name, who would be used to bring the nation of Israel back to the Lord. And glorious in the eyes of the Lord. He'd be glorious in doing that. And he'd be, God would be his strength. God would be using him, again, as a silver shaft or as a quiver in his hiding away and then use him at the appropriate time. So for a time period to be hidden away, for a time period to be unknown. Then at the right time, pull out of his quiver and use as a, silver, as a stumbled sword his word. Well, so if it's not Jacob who becomes Israel, again, how could he bring himself back? You know, and if it's not the nation of Israel, then who is it? Well, Israel, as we've seen last time we looked at the servant in, in Isaiah, Again, we'll be looking at other chapters on the servant referred to in Israel, in Isaiah. Israel, the word Israel literally comes from when Jacob wrestled with God. And God said, you will no longer be called Jacob. Uh, uh, Jacob cried out, bless me. And, 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 and what he was wrestling with, what he was wrestling with said, you will no longer be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel for, and then he gives the definition of the word Israel, for as a prince with God, you have overcome. So literal Israel means literally means a prince who wrestles with God and overcomes, or an overcomer with God. And we see that right in it in the word itself. Sar is right there in the word. It's Rael, so we've got Sar for Prince, and we have L in the word God, right? So Prince of God wrestles with God, Prince who wrestles with God, and overcomes an overcomer with God. So who is the one who is a prince with God, the prince of God, who overcomes, who is named beforehand while he was in his mother's womb? Well, Yeshua the Messiah was named while he was in his mother's womb. He is the ultimate overcomer who came in the flesh, came through a woman who overcame and who did not tempt it in all ways, just like as we are, fully took on flesh, fully took on humanity, but who, depending on the Father the whole time he was here, overcame and who did not sin, whose words are like the word of God, whose words are like a, a sword, sharp as the edge of the sword cutting asunder, and who is glory, and who is used by the Father in bringing Jacob and Israel back to the Lord. And again, who was named, when he was in his mother's womb, you shall call the child Yeshua, for he shall save his people. And we have the definition of his name there. Saving, he saves the people. He's our Savior. He shall save the people from their sins. In verse 6, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Again, it can't be Israel as a nation, nor Jacob the little person, as again it's talking afterwards. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation. And there's his name. Yeshua T, my salvation. 
You shall be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And here today, thousands of years after Isaiah wrote this and prophesied this, Yeshua's name is mentioned in bringing salvation to the ends of the earth, to both Jews and to Gentiles, as would be prophesied right here in this verse, Isaiah 49, verse 6, that not only just to the Jews, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant just to the Jews, just to the nation of Israel. But I would also use you as a light to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth. And today his name is mentioned to the ends of the earth. All around this globe, God has followers of Yeshua. He has been a light to them. He's been an inspiration to them. His words have brought life light and life and peace and joy and happiness and conviction and repentance and a turning, a teshuva, a turning back and a, pres a preserving and a restoring of our soul. He has done all of these things. His words have done all of these things. He was mentioned before he was born by name. And he was hidden away, as it said there in, in the verse 2, hidden away for the first 27 or so years of his life, or 30 or so years of his life, he was unknown. And then he comes on the scene and even surprised some people, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? And then he comes on the scene in three and a half short years. The work that the Father did through him in the short three and a half years. And his name is mentioned today around the world, the impact that that three and a half years had. Think about your last three and a half years. No doubt God has used you. No God, doubt God's blessings have been upon you or upon me. But will the last three and a half years of our life be spoken about 2,000 two, two years from now? If time should last? Just three and a half years. Of unhidden ministry. We see how he's been a light to the Gentiles and a restorer of Israel. And his salvation, his name, and his salvation saving us from our sins. It's happening all around the world. Amazing prophecy. But God wants us to know and not only know and see the power of God that he knows these things and he can name these things, and now all the scriptures point to this. Israel, the overcomer with God, the prince with God. But also to know that God loves us. And that God's salvation is in our lives as well. That he can be a light to us and a guidance to us. Give us direction and help. And help us in our time of need. And deliverance for us. And restoring and preserving us. Getting us back on the wrong, right path if we slipped off and to preserve us, and to keep us from falling. And to direct our ways, and to save us from sinning in the present day and into the future. Verse 7, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to him who man despises. He was despised. Still today, many despise him. To him whom the nations abhor, to the servants of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship. So again, this one is bigger than just the nation of Israel. This is the prince of God. They shall worship, but some will reject and others will receive. Because the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. And so yes, God chose the nation of Israel. And so we're seeing a duastic application here. Just as Moses foreshadowed the Messiah to come, just as David foreshadowed the Messiah to come, just as Abraham foreshadowed the Messiah to come, and, and the Messiah did not replace any of those people, or many others we could talk about, Jacob and others. Israel as a nation also foreshadowed 
And so Yeshua doesn't come along and replace Israel. He just is the fulfillment. They pointed forward. Moses, David, all of those others pointed forward to what he would be like. They were shadows. They were types. And he is the reality of it all. He is, Israel is chosen, and he is the chosen one, the ultimate chosen one. Israel is Israel, but he is the ultimate Israel. And thus says the Lord, in an accepted time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, there again, I have helped you, I will preserve you, and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth. God's calling on him. I have chosen you, and I've chosen you to do these things. Talking to the Messiah, the, thus says the Lord to, to his servant. An accepted time. And Daniel gives us the exact time of when he would come. The exact time period that he would minister. Three and a half years is mentioned specifically in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. He refers to that in an acceptable time. I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. And I preserved you, and he did all these things. God preserved him and kept him. And he has given us, given him as a covenant to us, as a promise to us of his salvation and to restore the earth. God wants to restore this earth. Bring us back to him. Created us in a his image originally in Adam and Eve. We've been sold out, and we sold ourselves out to Satan. Thus we've become in his image, and God wants to restore, bring back the original of what he created. He's going to restore this whole earth. He's going to transform this whole earth. He's going to destroy this whole earth and restore it anew and make it anew. Change it anew. Back into the Garden of Eden state that God originally wanted. Not only do these things point to the Messiah, point to the ultimate Israel, but he wants us to be joined with him as well and thus become princes and princes with God as well, overcomers with God as well, restorers of the earth as well. We even have a phrase for that, uh, restorers of the earth, to comb alum, restoring the earth, the repairers of the earth. God commissioned us from the very beginning not to be destroying the earth, but to care for the earth. He gave us that as a commission to Adam and Eve, the parents of mankind. And as a people, as a human, a human family, we've been destroying this earth. Uh, people can debate global warming, whether it's real or not real. The fact of the matter is we are destroying this earth. We could debate all day long whether the way we're destroying this earth is causing the climate to change or not. But the fact of the matter is we're dumping tons of garbage in the oceans. We're dumping tons of garbage into the air. We're dumping tons of garbage into our bodies. We're dumping tons of garbage into the earth. And we are destroying this place, both physically, and we are destroying this place mentally and emotionally and morally. And God has called us, above all people, to be the restorers of the earth and the preservers of the earth and to care for this earth. Now, our first and foremost job that God has commissioned us to is to bring his salvation to the ends of the earth, to share God's love and his peace and his joy and his light to the ends of this earth and word to the end of this earth. But at the same time we're doing that, there is no reason that we should be making the earth worse physically and mentally and emotionally. We can be doing both as well. Caring for God's earth as much as we possibly can. It calls us to be doing Tacoma alum, the stories of the earth. Verse 9, say to the prisoners, go forth. And to those in darkness, Show yourselves, and they shall feed along the roads and pastures on desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them. 
even by the springs of water, he will guide them. And so the first several verses of this chapter guide us to the Messiah, identify the Messiah, point us forward, his name before his word, give us these identifying marks so we know who he's referring to. And now the second part gives us wonderful promises. He said, I will make you a covenant to the people, a promise to the people. And these are some of the wonderful promises that he will guide and direct us. If you're hungering and thirsting for something better, if you're longing for something better, sense of dissatisfaction, a loneliness, a despair, an emptiness, pressures of this world, the heat and the sun of work and problems and, and, and sources and situations in your life, God will lead us and guide us by springs of water. If you're lost and confused, he will give guidance. Unknown future, or unknown what to do in certain situations, he will give guidance. He will give light. He will give direction. He'll feed us along the road and in the pastures. He says to the prisoners, if you're prison bound, if you're locked up in some habit, if you're locked up in some addiction, you're locked up in some mental problem from the past. You haven't grown out of some abuse or some neglect or something that's happened to you and you're still living in the past. It's a living, bound up prisoner of unforgiveness, prisoner of anger or bitterness or wrath. He promises to the prisoner, go forth. Those who are in darkness and confusion and doubt and discouragement and despair and and, and depression to show yourself. He will be a light to us. He'll deliver us from all of those things. The covenant promise. As so his words are like a sword that cuts through it all and give us deliverance. And he'll cause us to sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and he will have mercy on his afflicted. This is a song we're going to sing it tonight. How many songs have we seen? So many out of the song, out of Isaiah. Wonderful song. And so as we are delivered, as we're set forth from the prisons, as we're set out of the darkness, as we're led before the springs of water, as he satisfies our soul, and he meets our need, and he gives direction to our lives. It causes us to break out and sing. It causes us to be joyful and, and shout. It brings out singing twice, it mentions this. Because he has comforted us. He's had mercy on us. He's healed the afflicted soul. In all our afflictions, he was Heal whatever hurts we have. Heal whatever pains we have. The power of God. The mercy of God. The love of God. That sets us free. Heals us. His mercy on us. Comforts us. Comforts us in our grief. Comforts us in our losses. Comforts us in our hurts. Comforts us through our sorrows there with us, never leaving us nor forsaking us. He's in the fire of affliction with us. It shall not come nigh. He holds our hands and he walks us through. Whatever problem you're going through, whatever situation you're going through, he's there for you. He'll help you through it. He'll minister to your needs. Whatever you're grieving, Whatever your trouble is, he is there for us. To the ends of the earth, he will be there. Wherever you go, wherever you are, he is there. Verse 14, Zion said, the Lord has forgotten me. He has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? 
surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. Have you ever felt you've been, like you've been forgotten? Have you ever felt like God has forgotten you? Have you ever felt like he's not hearing your prayers? Have you ever felt like he doesn't care for you anymore? Have you ever felt like your sins have come up over your head and have just blotted him out? Have you ever felt like He's done so much wrong that he he cannot even look on you. Have you ever felt like even maybe if you haven't done anything wrong, but you just feel like he's forgotten you? Because so many problems are coming at you and so much trouble and so much despair from all different directions. It's like, where is God through this? Why are you allowing this? Like Job, who the Bible says did no wrong and yet had problem after problem after problem. He lost his house, he was on fire. He lost his property, he lost his his livestock, he lost his children, all of them dying at one time. Where's God? The Lord has forsaken me. He has forgotten me. God says, I cannot forget you. Any more than a woman could forget her nursing child. Not just her child, but her nursing child while she's nursing, while the child is nursing. While she's holding the child, how can she forget that she's holding a child? How can she forget that she has a child? He says, surely they may forget. Even under that condition, they may forget that they have a child. Yet, I will not forget you. God has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. He's there with you in the affliction. He sees us in the prison. And he says, go for it. He sees through the darkness. And he says, come forth. He sees us in our despair. And he has mercy on us. He sees us in our grief. And he has comfort for us. He doesn't forget us. He doesn't leave us. He loves you with an everlasting love. And then he goes on to tell us how much he has done so that he will not forget us. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. How could he forget? Raised you on the palm of my hand. Right? We look at our hands every day, no doubt. We do something, we reach for something, we're eating, we're, it's always, you know, right near our face or our eyes are having to guide it to what we're wanting it to do to pick something up. Our eyes are there looking and it's there. And we're washing them, we're using our hands in front of our face all the time. He says, How can I forget you? You're there in front of me all the time. I've engraved you with nails right through your name into my hand. Not just written with a marker that might wash away. Not even with a tattoo that might fade and grow old and wrinkle. But I've engraved you into the palm of my hand. Pierced through the palm of my hand. The wound in his hand will be there for eternity. You see, they were there even after his resurrection, even after his glorification. He told Thomas, put your fingers into the holes in my hand if you don't believe I am him. He's engraved your name into the palms of his hand. What an amazing prophecy long before that type of death was even invented. Isaiah, God knew and God told Isaiah and Isaiah wrote it down. That the servant, the called one, who I will name while he's in his mother's womb, the chosen one, will engrave, will be a light 
who will restore Israel and be a light to the Gentiles. And his name will go to the ends of the earth. We'll engrave everyone's name into the palm of his hand. What a God we serve. What a loving God we have. He's engraved you. He can't forget you. He hasn't forgotten you and he will not forget you. He's engraving you into his hand for eternity. And even if we choose not to receive his salvation, even if we choose not to receive his love, even if we choose not to receive his mercy, even if we choose not to receive his deliverance, even if we choose not heaven, for all eternity, he will remember his children. Those who love him and accepted him and those who reject him. His love is so great. He engraved everything into the palms of his hand. Verse 17. Your sons shall make haste, your destroyers, and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Look around and see all these gathered together and then they come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as with an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. So even if your children leave, make haste, and the destroyers, those who hate you, they lay waste upon you, they will go away. Those who are troubling you, those who are afflicting you, those who are causing problems in your life, those who are trying to destroy you, purposefully or unpurposefully, they will go away, God promises. And then God will gather them to you and you will put them on as an ornament. You will wear them. Continues on. From your waste and desolate places and the land of your destruction will now be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallow you up will be far away. So again, the destroyer, those who try and hurt you and destroy you and swallow you up and make you as nothing, get you fired, get you evicted, get you... Uh, get rid of you in some way, shape, or your form, divorce you and reject you and hurt you, they will be far away. God will put enmity between you and the serpent. God will put a wall between you and them. You'll end up wearing them. In your desolate places, in your waste places, the land of your destruction will now be too small. God will grow your land. They'll try and take it away, and God will grow your land. And it'll be too small. What was once wasted and desolate, God will bless. Like this earth, he will restore and make new. Verse 20, and the children you will have after you have lost the others, the others that left, who will bless up with others and will say again in your ears, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. I will bless and they grow and multiply. And you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 23. For they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Those who wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the servant. Those who wait on the chosen one. Those who wait on the light. Those who wait on the restorer of Israel and the light to the Gentiles. Those who receive him as salvation will not be ashamed. As the world tries to shame us, as the world tries to tell us we're no good, as the world tries to tell us our ideas are outdated, as the world tries to tell us we're foolish and ignorant because we believe God's word, because we believe what it says about how he made this world, because we believe what it says, what he calls us to do, because he tells us how to live morally, because it tells us right from wrong. They try and shame us. Tell us we're out of touch. Tell us we're bigots. Tell us we're haters. They try and shame us. We will not be ashamed. Those who try and cause shame in your personal life, those who are trying to shame you in your personal life, trying to, trying to make you look foolish in your life, trying to make you look wrong, 
trying to make you out as a liar, trying to destroy you. You will not be ashamed as you wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. God does this. God does this in mighty ways. God does this in miraculous ways. But often it seems that God waits for His perfect timing, not our timing. Often our back is against the Red Sea and the walls of the mountains on either side, and the Egyptians coming down through the narrow passage at us. Wait upon the Lord. When it seems like it's impossible, when it seems like there's no way out, when it seems like there's nothing else, nothing but despair, and that's when God works the most. And you will know that I am the Lord. That's why. Because if there was some other way, if there was some other that I could get a loan, if someone could help me out, then it's because of them, or because of me, or because of my credit, or my friendship with them or my talent, or my ability, or my smartness. But it's when we have no ability. And trusting only in him, you will know that I am the Lord. But you will not be ashamed as you wait for him. He will come through. And he will deliver. And he will do best, better than we could ever imagine. The waste in desolate places will become too small. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? Hey, lion has a prey. Are you going to go and rip it out of his hand? Are the captives in captivity? Can they be delivered? Thus says the Lord, verse 25, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible be delivered. Nothing is impossible to the Lord our God. Even if it seems like you're right in the lion's mouth, even as the devil goes forth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, even as he seems like he has you pinned down, even if it seems like he has you captive, it seems like he has you in the burning fire, bound up. He will set the captives free. He will say to the prisoners, go forth. To those in darkness, come out. Even the captives of the mighty shall be delivered, shall be taken away. And the prey of the terrible be delivered. Yeshua has come as our deliverer as our Redeemer, as our Restorer, to set us free. Whatever has you captive, whatever addiction, whatever habit, whatever sin, whatever problem, whatever worry, whatever fear, whatever anxiety, whatever hatred, whatever anger, whatever unforgiveness, you will be set free. Wait on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Surrender to the Lord. Confess your sins to him. Accept his salvation. Turn your problems over to him. Release them to him. Let go of them. And trust in him. And know that he is the Lord. And receive of his deliverance. And receive of his power. In verse 25, For I will contend with him who contends with you. I will save your children. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful promise to parents and grandparents, great-grandparents. He will save our children. Oh, we love that wonderful, yes, wonderful promise. But also for all and everyone, whether our children have gone astray or not, I will contend with him who contends with you. The mighty and the terrible our God will contend with them and he will deliver us and he will set us free. So whoever is contending with you right now, maybe there's some lawsuit against you or maybe some edict against you or maybe something's causing problems. Whoever is contending with you, whether Satan or human, 
God will contend with them for you. There's no better contender. We've got a big brother who will come and step in. No matter how terrible, no matter how mighty, he is more mighty. He is God most high. He will contend with those that contend. What a wonderful promise. Lay hold of that. Maybe write that on the palm of your hand. <laughs> whenever you're going through a problem, whenever you're going through a trouble, God will contend with them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in dark places, evil angels. God will contend with them for us. And he will deliver us. He will save us and he will save our children. Wonderful, wonderful promise. Verse 26, I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh. It's okay to quote that. God, feed them with their own flesh. <laughs> They're oppressing me. Feed them, that's what your word says. You always have to pray, oh God, be so nice to them. Well, he says, pray for our enemies and bless those who curse you and despitefully use you. But you can quote this problem as verse also. God, you promised you would feed them their own flesh. They've been eating me up and chewing me down. Feed them their own flesh. And they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. Let them consume themselves. And all flesh shall know, know that I, the Lord, am your Savior. So who is this one who is named, mentioned three times, his name is right there, <laughs> named from before his womb, his mother's womb. I am the Lord. I am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One. He is Almighty. He is the One. Trust in Him. Someone's contending with you. Someone's oppressing you. Trust in the mighty arm of the Lord. Wait upon him. Lay your burdens at his feet. Whatever your trouble is tonight, or from the past, or maybe you just want to hold on to these promises, maybe you're cruising right now, things are going well, don't worry. The devil's not done yet. and He'll come and attack you. He'll oppress you. He'll try and consume you. He'll try and destroy you try and make you ashamed. So claim these promises then tonight for the future. If you're not needing it tonight, lay hold on these promises and ask God to store them up in your mind so we can hold fast, be encouraged. As we go through the problems, God contend with them. God, have them eat their own flesh. God, deliver me out of the darkness. There's a point of feeling like God's forsaken you or forgotten you. Remember, God is engraved into the palm, both palms, the palm of his hand. So whatever you're needing tonight, whether deliverance, freedom, comfort, strength, maybe your children have gone astray and you want to lay hold of that promise. Whatever promise is there, don't we call it? Any promises, whatever you're needing. Let God meet your needs as we pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we're thankful that you are the mighty God. We are thankful that you are our redeemer. We're thankful that you are our savior. And you are our salvation. We're thankful that you came to this world and thank you that you were named even while you were in your mother's womb. Thankful that you overcame. Thankful that you are mighty. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you comfort us. Thank you that you deliver us. Thank you that you will expand us. Thank you that you will save our children. Thank you that you will contend with those that are contending with us. Thank you that we will wear them as ornaments. Thank you that we will know that you are the Lord our God. Thank you that you will restore us and that you'll be a light to the nation and to all the ends of the earth. Use us in helping that go forth. Thank you that you're res restoring the earth and make us restorers of the earth as well.
Thank you for comforting us. Thank you for having mercy upon us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for never forgetting us and never forsaking us. And thank you for engraving us into the palm of your hand. In Yeshua's name.